The message that I want to share this morning is an awkward message. Uh, but that's the beauty of just straight through preaching through the Word of God. Sometimes God, and how He has laid out the Word of God, brings the message out that we need to hear, even if I don't quite understand it, or why it would show up next. And so when we preach through the Word of God, we've been preaching through Abraham's life, there have been things that have showed up. And today, uh, the, the question of the hour you might say is, have you ever been hurt by the godly? Or at least those who claim the name of Christ. them. I'm not just talking about a little hurt, but a deep hurt. A deep and resounding hurt within your heart by somebody who was standing in as an authority figure in a church or uh, uh, representing God to you. You know how hard that can be on your faith? You know how destructive that can be? Listen to some of these scenarios I want to share with you this morning. See if you've ever been in one of these, if you've ever experienced one of these, if you've ever seen one of these in the different churches that you've been in. A regular attendee talks to a church. Uh, a regular attendee to a church talks loudly behind two new visitors that people like them only come at Easter and Christmas. Doesn't that just cause your heart to hurt when you hear something like that? Plans are made for a trip, a church trip, but they obviously leave out a certain family that certain people think are lesser than they are. You ever seen anything like that in a church? You ever felt anything like that in a church before? Um, two young children hear a deacon cussing out back after the pastor has just brought a message on purity of life and speech. You ever seen anything like that? You know why we see things like that occur or we hear things like that occur? Because Christians are people. You know that term godly? That's a, a, a hard term to use as an adjective for a person, isn't it? Because yes. <laughs> most of the time, there's people that are more godly than others, but there's... Most of the time, none of us look like that blessed Redeemer that Ashton was singing about that was hanging on that tree dying for the sins of the world. And the worst, I think, the worst that we see here in our day and age, thank God we've never, I've never been in any church where I've ever seen anything like this, but where someone is abused, uh, a young child is abused, as we're seeing within the Catholic Church now, uh, all the time, how these young children are being abused. Uh, mentally, physically. And it's disturbing what we see. So I ask you today, have you ever been hurt by the godly? And I think the question that might resound is we've all been hurt by the godly at one point in time. We've all seen those that we put up on a pedestal fall down. We've seen people uh, that said they were of Christ, but they certainly were not of Christ. We've seen these things in our life and we've wondered in our hearts, well, is all this real? Is this true? If this is the way it is, is this true? It's in these experiences that I believe we learn where the true foundation of your faith lies. You hear me? Is the foundation of your faith in a person, in a human being, or is it in God Himself? Do you have a relationship with God or do you have a, a feeling that you're going along with based on what you've seen in another individual? Is your faith fully in God or is it in the people of God? Folks, I tell you what, the people of God will fail, but God will never fail. Amen. God will never fail. And that's what I want to look at here today. And it might surprise you this isn't some new scenario. As I've been saying, we're going back uh, almost uh, 4,000 years ago here with the story of Abraham. Uh, this isn't a new experience. Uh, as we've been reading through this, we've been preaching through this, Abraham and his wife Sarah were promised a child by God, but they got kind of anxious in their old age. And in their mindset, they thought they'd go along with the rest of the culture, right? They'd just go ahead and they'd break one of their servant girls, uh, give them a child. And so this lady named Hagar, she is uh, brought in, forced to have a child uh, for Sarah here through Abraham, a pagan slave girl. We find out that wasn't God's plan at all. Of course it wasn't God's plan. Uh, 
And um, after uh, uh, Sarah attacked her, after she actually did get pregnant, she went running off into the wilderness and she was sitting there crying and we saw in a past message how God had literally come and spoke to this pagan woman out here to let him know that he sees her. He sees her. Now, after that, I believe that's where she truly began kind of her relationship with God there when she actually had an experience with God. So Hagar came to the Lord in a situation where his followers had used her. She came to the Lord in that type of a situation. Now after Hagar's child has grown up, uh, God actually fulfilled his promise to Abraham and her child Ishmael has uh, gotten jealous over the promised son and uh, Sarah wants them put out. Abraham mis has misgivings about it. He's concerned. I don't know if I'll, that's the right thing to do. But God tells him it's okay. You can let them out into the wilderness. And that's where I want to begin our message here today in Genesis chapter 21 and verse 14. 21, 14. If you'll stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. It says here, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. You may be seated. Now, now I have a question for you today. Have you ever been hurt as bad uh, by God's people as Hagar here has been hurt? Have you ever been hurt so bad that you were made into a slave by God's people? Have you ever been hurt so bad that you were given away as a sexual tool to gain a child by God's people? Have you ever been attacked after getting pregnant, after being used, and now 17 years later you're cast out with nothing, nothing at all? And as she goes out here in the wilderness in the midst of all this trouble and trials that's coming upon her head here, look what it says here in verse 15. And the water was spent in the bottle. So she drank all that water. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs out here in the wilderness. And she went and sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were, a bow shot. For she said, this is what she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and she wept. She wept. She cried out. Now I want to ask you something. In all the different things that went on with Hagar, in all the ways that God's people had actually hurt Hagar, and all the different things that were going on here, who's she crying out to? There's nobody else around, is there? Nobody else around. So who does she think is there? Hagar knows in her heart that God is still there. And when God's people have hurt you, when you've been hurt by somebody who is in an authority position and you feel like everything's going apart, do you still know that God is still there with you? He's still there. He's still watching. And even in her, her denial of what's going on here, she looks up and she cries out, please just don't let me see Him. She remembered what happened back in Genesis 16 and verse 13. She called the name of the Lord that spake unto her there, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that sees me? And I tell you something. When you are in despair and you feel like all of God's people have left you, you feel like the whole world is against you, God is still there and he is still watching over you. When you're crying out, why, in, in, in agony, wondering, you know, it seems like all of this faith is falling apart for me, God is still there and His eyes are still on you. Now, where are your eyes at? Where are your eyes at in the midst of that kind of stress, that kind of struggle, that kind of shaking of your faith? Where do your eyes turn to? Can I tell you where most of our eyes turn to? The people. The things that are going on, the bad things. That's what her eyes turn to, right? My child is going to die. I know back here in the wilderness, you promised me this child was going to be a great nation. You promised me, you God who sees me. You promised me that. But I deny that promise. Just don't make me have to watch him die. Have you ever been hurt like that? Did you just give up on God? And you said, why? See, Hagar here lost faith in the promise that God had given her. God had told her that boy would become a mighty nation, right? Just don't make me watch him die. 
It's easy to lose faith in God's promises when God's people aren't acting like God's people. It's easy, isn't it? It's easy. And that shows you where your eyes are at. Where are your eyes at? What do you see around you in the midst of the struggle? Are you looking to God? Or are you looking to your situation? Are you looking to, to, to the, the people around you? Are you looking to those things, the soap opera that's going on? Many people have faced evil in a church. It came out recently about the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, they did a survey over 20 years, and there were 700 victims. Now, this breaks my heart to tell you this, church. Over 20 years, there were 700 victims in, in Southern Baptist churches of sexual abuse by, by, by pastors, Sunday school teachers, people of that nature. And they put this together to compile an archive of allegations of sexual abuse, sexual assault, and other serious misconduct involving Southern Baptist pastors and other church officials. Their report uh, detailed 380 credibly accused perpetrators. And that would make up about less than half a percent of all Southern Baptist churches worldwide. But folks, that less than half a percent makes me sick to my stomach to think that something like that happened. That somebody that was claiming the name of Jesus Christ would abuse an individual. It makes me sick to my heart to think that somebody would do something like that. They must not know God whatsoever. Amen. They must not have a clue of who Jesus Christ is because they ought to shake in their boots to imagine that, they, that what God is going to do to them for what they've done. There will be a vengeance for that, my friend. Amen. Whether in this life or the next. There will be. Because there is a justice that will come one day. But Hagar, Hagar here, had trusted God in the midst of a terrible situation that she had lived in for many, many years. And all things around her were pointing to the fact that things weren't going to turn out okay. But, just as those those who truly know Jesus Christ, she couldn't deny the fact she'd heard His voice. She still called out here in the midst of this dark hour. says, I know you see me. Just don't make me watch Him die. Just don't make me watch Him die. She couldn't deny that He was there. He was listening. Folks have been seriously hurt by those claiming the name of God or by Christians who fell up to live to the name of God. But if they ever heard Christ in their heart, they cannot deny He is there. Folks, if you have truly received Jesus Christ in your heart, you cannot deny He's there. You might spit at Him. You might cuss at Him. You might throw everything you can at Him. But you cannot deny Him. I promise you that. You may get so mad at Him, you run around with a billboard and say, I'm an atheist. You may run around and say, I reject God and all these different things. But you know in your heart of hearts that He's there and He's watching, right? Amen. If you've had a relationship with Him, you know that. And He'll whip you back till you get to where you need to be. He will. He will. I promise you He will. I know from experience. There's another lady I want to tell you about this morning. A lady named Jennifer Greenberg. I found out about her this week as I was planning this message. And she, from her earliest memories, uh, remember uh, her father, her church-going father, uh, uh, abusing her sexually, psychologically, and spiritually. These are from her words. She says, I didn't realize I was being abused because I had just grown up in that environment. She said, I often felt unsafe, but it never crossed my mind that my dad was abusive or this wasn't normal. And though, uh, she says, he didn't live out a single biblical principle, her father read the Bible and studied theology books, insisting that he's a family attend church every Sunday. And she says this, she says, By God's grace, he led, now listen to this, By God's grace, he led my family to extremely biblical churches, churches that loved the gospel and were spiritually rooted. But that worked to his disadvantage, she said, because what happened was I learned that my father in heaven was nothing like my biological father. 
I, I, even when I didn't understand what was happening as this as a child, I was presented with a God who was gentle and kind and loving. But then six days a week I had a father who would abuse me. I wonder how many kids, how many young people, how many people have grown up here today that were spiritually, mentally, and, and God forbid, physically abused in their lives by, by individuals who were in power, and yet they learned that there's a heavenly Father who loves them and cares for them. And that's what gave them the strength to get through that opportunity at that time. Think about that. My dad, he grew up in a bad environment. He had a father who was, I can't imagine, because my daddy tried to be the complete opposite of what his father had been to him. He was mean. It's told to me that one time he uh, got drunk, got a shotgun, chased him out in the woods, and tried to shoot him dead while he was drunk. Said he would run off and cheated with some other woman while my grandma was working. But daddy knew of another father. He knew of another father who loved him without, w without any of this drama, this violence, and all these different things, who loved him enough that he come and died for his sins on old cross. And by that, he chose to be the father that I needed. Amen? Amen. How many of us have come out of a dark place because there was a father before us who went through the dark place, right? We didn't have to go through that type of thing. Folks, I feel for people who are hurt by people in authority and God forbid people who claim the name of Christ. What a sick thing. The devil is a wicked and twisted individual. Amen. He destroys one human being so that human being can go out and destroy another. It's sad, folks. It's sick. This girl, she said, this Jennifer, she entered her teenage years. She considered ending her own life. She kept thinking, if I can just make it to my 18, I'll be okay. But when I was 15, I had a new maturity level, an understanding of adult behaviors. And those last three years, she said, seemed like an eternity. I felt like I couldn't do it anymore. At the same time, I was really worried that if I died by suicide, I wouldn't go to heaven, that God, just like my earthly father, would abandon me. With nowhere else to turn, she, gave the, she, she prayed this prayer, much as Hagar is praying here today. She prayed, God, you've got to give me a sign that you love me and that I'm not alone. Give me a sign that you love me and I'm not alone. <laughs> she said at that moment, she clearly heard the voice of God, I will never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> you know where she got that from? You know where I hear the voice of God? It's right here in this old book. Amen. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I don't care if all the people that claim my name forsake you. I'm with you. And I love you. And I care for you. Our God is good, folks. Amen. The lady said, she said, I decided to live for the sake of my mom and sisters. I was decided I was going to survive, and that's why I'm here today, she said. The next three years were some of the hardest of my life, she said. My dad's violence continued, as did the, the, the sexual and psychological abuse, but I held on to those words God spoke to me, and they carried me through that time. Now, I want to make clear here with Hagar, this is a different situation than, than it was with this woman in some ways. I believe Sarah and Abraham knew that they had sinned immediately, and... Uh, and this was an awkward situation in a different environment during that time. Uh, Sarah herself said, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom in Genesis 16.5. But the point is this, my friend, that God sees you. He saw Hagar in, in the situation she was left in. And he sees you here today if you're in a bad situation as well no matter what it is. And He loves you, my friend, and He wants you to see things differently. You see, what happened to that young lady, once she heard those words, she began to see things differently. Things didn't look the same way as they did before. And the God who sees her loves her. Look here at Genesis 21, verse 17. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven. It amazes me, folks. Here's this old pagan girl, and the angel of God's going to come visit her twice. And said to her, What aileth thee, Hagar? 
Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer, just like God had promised, right? And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Now look here. God reaffirmed the promise to her as he had done before. He said, I'm going to make him a great nation. What are you talking about? Let him die. But what did she say here? She looked at him. God looked at her and said, Open your eyes. Open your eyes. What's the natural turn in every one of us? We always look to the bad. We always look to the negative that we're in. We always look to the hard part of the situation at the expense of seeing the positive. And in that negative situation, we miss the living water right in front of us. You hear me? Amen. We miss that living water that can give us life. It's right in front of us, right in front of our face. Yet we're all about the bad. We're all about the, the negative around us. People will let you down, folks. They're imperfect. But God will never let you down. We may not understand, but He always does what's right. He always brings us through these situations. And right here, it appears as if God had deserted this woman, but God had actually set her free. Amen. God set her free. I mean, that's the first thing that came to my mind. My goodness, He let her out with a bit, a bit of water and all this. God set the old slave girl free. She went back toward her old home. Her son married uh, somebody that was from Egypt like her. God allowed her to be set free here. But we look in the negative, don't we? And we don't see the living water. Folks, the living water is right here for you today. All you got to do is come and take a drink, don't you? It's right here if you'll just come and receive it. She would live as a free woman in Paran, and her son would take a bride of her people in Egypt. God had fixed the situation. But see, once we understand and we see the living water and we accept the living water, we've got to move on. And that's what she did, wasn't it? She moved on. Have you moved on from the situation where that godly person hurt you? Have you moved on? Moved on to the next step? Because if you sit there and you dwell in all that anger and bitterness and hate, what do you do? You just sit there and you get sour and sour until you go hurt somebody else. Right? You've got to learn to let it go. You've got to move on. John Wesley, the great preacher of Methodism, he was walking around with a man who was disturbed that God isn't good. He had all these troubles and, and you know, he just didn't think God was good. And he, This was back in the agriculture society, of course. He was walking along and they were out in the field and there was this cow. And he see this cow looking over a wall. And he said the cow was looking over the wall to the man because she cannot see through it. And that is what you must do with your wall of trouble. Look over it and avoid it. Go over it. Look over it. Move forward. There may be someone here who has hurt you deeply. There may be someone who isn't here who has hurt you deeply. Who do you need to forgive to release the wall in front of you so you can leave, so you can move on? Who do you need to forgive here today? What sin do you need to repent of against your brother and sister so the wall can be torn down. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's easy at all. I want you to know what forgiveness is not. Because everybody says that in church, right? Forget, 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 forgive and forget and all that. You don't have to forget. Forgiveness isn't forgetting. Trust may never completely return with that person that you forgive. But you can let it go. You can release them of it. It's not letting them off the hook either in the sense of justice. If they've done something unlawful, they need to be brought to the full extent of the law, don't they? They do. So justice is not, not about forgiveness. Uh, trusting them again is not about forgiveness. It's all about the idea is you don't have to pay me back. I'm going to let it go and I'm going to take the chain off of my leg and I'm going to walk on. I'm going to walk away like Hagar did. Forgiveness is a release. It's giving yourself the freedom to move on. To move on to the next level. Letting God get the vengeance for it. And it's not based on whether or not they forgive you or they say they're sorry or whatever they do. It's about letting it go. Letting it go. There's some here today that need to repent. 
There are some need to forgive. There are some need forgiveness. And there are some, some need that living water here this morning. Some of y'all do. You need that living water. Maybe you just need a fresh drink of it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how this message may have spoke to you this morning. But I believe God has spoke here today. I do. I do. Colossians 3, 12 through 13 tells us what a real godly person ought to be. It says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, listen to this church, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. What wall needs to be torn down in your life so you can move on out today like Hagar did? Brother, can we get a song together this morning? I want to ask you this morning, what, what has God spoke to you here? Is there some kind of a tremendous burden that you're carrying around of hatred and unforgiveness that you need to lay down here at this altar this morning? Just lay it down. Let God have it. God will have it eventually anyway, won't He? God's going to take that. He's going to bring all justice into this world. It's not your right or ability to bring the justice. But can you let it go? Can you give it to God? Can you see this morning that there's living water right here at this altar that you need to receive? Can you see that this morning? Or are you just going to sit back and say, I'm going to be bitter and I'm going to continue on with this? I don't know what God's told you in this message this morning. I don't, but I do know He spoke. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church. We are a Bible-believing church called to love all people without bias by proclaiming and teaching the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are located directly off of Exit 4 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. You can see us clearly from the interstate. We have worship each Sunday at 10.30 and 6.30 p.m. I hope you'll make plans to join us. It's all about Jesus, my friend, and we pray that we may be able to have the opportunity to share with you personally the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ.